Hello! We have got Chris in the studio today, a friend of another Chris, Christopher Berry D, who was on recently talking about how he went and interviewed serial killers. And Chris has done something similar, including with Ian Brady, the Moore's murderer. So it is going to get dark. It is going to get graphic. And before we go there, though, thank you very much for coming on, Chris. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about your background and what qualifies you to write about killers? Yeah, my background was I was brought up in care. I was born into a Jesuit orphanage left there by my mother, who was a schoolgirl. Uh, they tracked her down and she signed me over to them. So I grew up in... A, Your mom was a schoolgirl? She was a 13-year-old schoolgirl. I know, it's pretty back then as well. Don't ask me what year, but, yeah. you know, a long time ago. And so I grew up in a Catholic children's home and I was adopted at age four. And I went to live in Hayes with the Hearts, and my real name was Tracy Mary Sweeney, and they didn't keep my real name, they changed it to Christine Hart, Christine Joan Hart, and I lived with them. My adoptive father was sexually abusive to me, and that went on until I hit puberty, and my mother was violent. She used to make me lie face down on the bed and, and, and whip me. Um, oh. The backs of my legs were, you know, in a pretty bad way. I stayed off school quite a lot. And then when I got to puberty, for some reason, they were quite strict with me. They wouldn't let me get, go out. I went out one night and, and stayed out with a friend, came back and they had a social worker waiting for me and basically shipped me off to care and which was quite scary because i was told by people as soon as you get into the care home you've got to have a fight and the social worker took me to a place called middlesex lodge and it was a ball store and he said you might get put in there because there's no care homes right now and Eventually, I found myself at a place called Olympic House and, no, Bedroll Gardens first. Um, I was in there for quite some time. And then I was moved to Olympic House and spent my teenage years in care, which, you know, was quite interesting. I I'd been quite sheltered. I went to an all-girls grammar school and, you know, was quite posh and sheltered and, you the kids in there were Borstal, Borstal boys, and the girls were quite rough. Uh, I, w I was lucky, though. I, there was a gypsy girl who, who lived there, and as soon as I got there, she said that she would protect me, and she did. And uh, So I ended up enjoying it, really. And then when it came to 18, I was told that I would have to leave and go to a homeless hostel and sign on the dole and that was pretty pretty awful um there was a student that came to our home whose father had a detective agency and he asked some of the kids you know would they like to interview for the job and it was basically tracing missing people surveillance that kind of thing and my boyfriend at the time trevor he got an interview i had an interview and i got the job he wasn't that pleased. He said, it's like Ronnie Biggs getting a job as a copper. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I started doing that. And then at the kids' home, they said I would be better off if, if I lived back with my parents again, which was quite odd. But I decided to go back. So I went back to live with them and then went to work every day as a private investigator. Wow, that was quite a harrowing, unexpectedly harrowing introduction. And um, people have got to be moved by what you've been through because it's a reoccurring uh, theme on this channel. Of we started out primarily introduce, uh, interviewing people who've been in prison, and the childhood trauma and the abuse and paedophilia just seem to be coming up time and time again. And then the person doesn't have the tools to deal with it, so they end up on drugs, self medicating, which leads to crime. Mm prostitution for women um, drug dealing for men typically 
and uh, starts out and then it just gets escalates into heavier and heavier crime mm. but it seems like you were on that cycle but managed to um avoid the heavier stuff coming out of the abuse you managed to go into this positive trajectory mm. so what what made what made you different then from people who get onto drugs and things like that I, my friends were all taking drugs and heroin and the hard stuff, and I hung out with a really rough crowd, but I just didn't like it. You know, I, I took some dope and it made me really, really paranoid. I think it was the effect it had on me that, that I didn't like it. You know, I would drink, I would sniff glue. Um, you know, I was arrested by the cops. I would do things like go up to cops, say, I'll oh, nick me and start kicking the side of their car and climbing on the top of a police car and saying, you know, come and nick me guys and throwing bottles at them. So I, I did, you know, I did find myself in a prison cell, um, you know, now and again. And it did shock me. And I thought, you know, where's my life going? I was this girl at grammar school. And, you know, my parents had, you know, pushed me um, in the direction, you know, back into care. I didn't need to go back into care around that time. It was pretty harsh. And I think it was guilt because of what they'd done and they were worried about me telling. And some of the staff at the kids' home, you know, they, they, they did point it out and they were saying things and they were kind of revealing my parents and they wanted to stay hidden. They were Catholic and it was all very respectable and linked to the church. And my father's sister was a nun with the daughters of St. Paul and she had taken me under her wing. I was went to Boston to become a nun with her. That didn't work out, so I came back again. So I had that tie to the church as well that, that kept me a little bit on the straight and narrow. You know, I, I would go to church very often with her and, you know, I had that strong need for God and, you know, that that kind of thing. So I suppose that, that kept me, that kept me, you know, probably, or maybe it was just the, the drugs made me paranoid because a lot of my friends were on it. Uh, some of my friends went into prostitution, ended up in prison. There was a boy who hung himself because he was raped by the social workers. Mm. Yeah, so much. And, and it's all because the social workers um, – in the children's homes, we girls used to try and seduce them. You know, they would come on duty. We would sit on their knee, try and kiss them, and they they wouldn't be interested. They'd be interested in the boys, which was quite horrible. Well, we interviewed a guy called Darren Jeffries, and the title of his podcast was "Gang Raped by Social Services." And it's like everywhere he went, therapist room or whatever, they and they were pimping out the kids. It was the boys that suffered more. <sighs> Strange, isn't it? It's. And it really ruined a lot of them, you know, because he didn't know, you know, I remember talking to a boy at Hampton, he said, I think I enjoyed it and I feel I want to die now because I enjoyed it. And I was saying, look, you know, this is what happened to you. You know, it's not, it's not in you, um, but it still affects him to this day. Yeah. But, you know, it's awful what goes on. And I think these people that go into um, working in these care homes, they do for that very reason. Just like you got people joining the Catholic priesthood because they know that they'll get the best lawyers for them when they get caught committing paedophilia and they'll just move them around and there won't be any repercussions. Yeah. I know I know. I was listening to Putin said something about the West being full of paedophiles. Mm. I think he said it today. And I think the Roman Catholic Church, because I remember ringing um, the Crusades of Rescue and saying, you know, you put me in with paedophiles. You, you know, he was a paedophile, didn't you know? You know, my, my, my adoptive mother was, you know, violent to me. And you could see they were very childish people and they were actually cousins, you know, so didn't they look into them at all? And the woman that answered the phone the first time I, I rang many years back now, she she said to me, there's quite a few people of your age that ring in to say that happened to them. So I don't know. I mean, were they doing it deliberately? It's, you know, I mean, makes you think, doesn't it? Well, it seems like there's an epidemic of it in the church. And we're doing a documentary on Jimmy Savile right now, four-hour documentary. It just seems to be particularly prevalent during that period of time. It seems that um, there was a lot less taboo around things and people could get away with things that they can't get away with now. So fortunately, things have changed, but the victims, you know, it's it's with them for the rest of their lives, isn't it? The pain and the suffering. I know, you don't ever really get over it. It affects you sexually. Obviously, you know, I, I've got a lot of blocks there and, you know, I never married because of it. And, you know, it does... 
it just, you know, I said to someone the other day, it's like they might as well kill you, you know, because. Yeah. All right. So we left off then. You said that you joined a private detective agency in London at age 18. Your colleagues were ex MI5, ex military. And because you were a young girl, you were able to do surveillance work and get, get away on notice doing that. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they used you to get close to some some of the the men that they were spying on. Is that the case? Yeah, you you know I was um, used to cozy up to people if they thought somebody you know was up to stuff and they wanted to spy on them. It was for many different reasons. Um, for instance, there was a filmmaker over from South Africa who was doing stuff on the government that the government didn't like. So they wanted this agency wanted to put a tail on him and someone to get close to him so it's that kind of thing where you would just you know cozy up or go along undercover or become an employee of a firm that they wanted to spy on and just work there and, and report on what people were doing and you got taught on how to trace missing people and to um, follow cars without being noticed. What what techniques did they teach you? For the those? boring stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, my driving isn't that great. So, um, you know, I would often be sitting in a car with somebody else who was pretty, you know, the ex-army guys are really good at driving. My driving is not that <laughs> great. But I would be sitting there, you know, um, on surveillances, which are quite boring. You know, you're sitting there for hours. Yeah. And, just taking pictures and, you know, I still do surveillance, you know, I still work as an investigator, so. Yeah. But I don't like it, you know, I'd rather be doing something else. Really? So what age were you then when you felt inclined to be interested in the Moore's murderer, Ian Brady? Well, that happened around age 13. And age 13? Yeah, it was when I'd gone into care and I was interested in tracking down my real parents. Mm. And I was given just this t tiniest bit of information from the Crusades of Rescue, the Catholic yeah. um, Children's Society. Um, there was a whole file, but they said, it's your mother's business. It's not your business. It was pretty harsh. Mm. Um, they told me that my real father was a criminal. Mm. And so I thought around that time, it was very hard for me to stomach adoption. I had just felt that, you know, why didn't her family take me in? You know, why do you have to be dumped somewhere? And I kind of wanted a reason. And when they said, oh, your real father's a criminal, I latched onto it a lot because I thought that's the perfect excuse, isn't it? If, you know, I'm bad blood or something. Yeah. And so I went to the true crime section of the library looking through and you know i i read lots of books on matt vicker um the other guy oh gosh i can't remember his name the one that hung out with matt vicker he's who's written a lot of books um probin wally probin his books and just i used to haunt the true crime section <laughs> and it was one time i came across a book on the moore's case it was beyond belief mm. and I thought, you know, wow, what if he was my father? That would be interesting because my mother had come from Manchester. And it just it kind of just crossed my mind. But I remember taking the book out, reading it, and just becoming hugely interested in the way it was written. I come across evil, what well, I come across evil with my um adoptive father sexually abusing me and in the church because you know I'd sat and meditated uh, with the priests and with my aunt aunt Kathleen and I was interested in the way evil was portrayed in beyond belief and that it portrayed Brady as not only being involved in black magic that he had somehow special powers to come out of his body. Um, it's an interesting book, and it's written by a man who is, um, so they say, Emily Williams, an occultist. And I found it interesting. However, I did f then find out later it has absolutely nothing to do with the Morse case or mm. Brady. It's, it's more or less a novel, you know, um, beautifully written and a fascinating book, but nothing to do with reality. So we have a big American audience then. Could you just explain to them who Ian Brady was and what happened with the Moore's case? Yeah, he murdered five children. Um, he raped them first. He buried them 
on moorland, um, the Yorkshire Moors, and two of the children couldn't be found. Um, he also murdered a 16-year-old Pauline Reed and then a 17-year-old Edward Evans when he invited Edward Evans back to his house with Myra Hindley, his girlfriend, and proceeded to chop him up more or less with an axe. I mean, they're, they're just absolutely horrific murders, absolutely absolutely horrific and then you look at Brady and I remember thinking maybe it was the influence of the book but I remember thinking is there something else involved there is there some kind of it just felt that there was black magic involved there was some kind of Brady was 25 years of age and I just felt like investigating the case for some reason and so I did, and I wrote to him a couple of letters. He was in Wormwood Scrubs, and I was young. I was 13 at that point, and sometimes me and my friends would ring up Wormwood Scrubs and talk to the warders and say, you know, what's going on there. I passionately at the time wanted to become a psychiatrist um, because, again, my adoptive parents took me when I was very young to uh, – my father used to take me with him to Dublin and he took me to St. Brendan's, I think it's St. Brendan's, it's an asylum in Dublin and his brother was in there and it's this massive old fashioned asylum and it was just terrifying for me as a young girl to go and sit there and there were people clocking like chickens mm. and banging their head against the wall and I saw a guy in a white coat and I went to talk to him and he was really kind. I sat in his office and I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be mm. a psychiatrist. So I had this passion to do it. And at school, um, when I went into care, they started saying, you know, you, you, you're not coming into school. I wasn't coming into school. I was hanging out with the other kids. And basically my O-levels went for a burton. And then they said, you, you're not going to be a psychiatrist. You're not going to be anything. You're just going to end up in prison. So I ended up quite bitter. And I think part of me want, thought that I would get to Brady and get inside his head and find out, you know, find out what really went on. It was just this, like, interest. You mentioned that Brady had a girlfriend, Myra Hindley. What was her involvement in the Moors murders? I'm not sure. I think she, I think, you know, people say that, you know, she just drove in places and he took these poor, unfortunate children off for walks um, into the darkness on the Yorkshire Moors. Other people say that she was present. I would be with a second and say she was present and she went along with it and that they were folly adieu, as they call it. Um, they call it shared madness. What about recordings of the atrocities they committed? What were in those recordings? They taped Leslie Ann Downey and recorded her screaming and recorded Christmas carols and really awful and took photographs. They're the most horrific crimes ever, I think. So you were wondering whether there was an occult element to this, and then you decided to write to and visit Brady when you were twenty-one. It didn't. It didn't. It, it was quite slow as it went. Um, I had started writing, didn't get a reply. He was then moved to Park Lane, which is an asylum, and I saw it in the newspapers. Um, there was a a headline Brady after 25 years or something and he was moved and I remember I was on the top deck of a bus and I thought oh that's that that's that um Brady um and I thought I know I'll just bang off a letter and I got a response which quite shocked me you know it's hard to think that someone like that actually exists so I was like what and I was dating a guy at the time Ray we were engaged and he you know, I took the letter to him and he was like, you know, wow, so interesting. You're going to write back. So we sat together and compiled a little rejoinder. And next thing he said, come up to meet me. And I, I was in two minds. I thought, you know, should I? My boyfriend said, you know, don't go, don't go. It's crazy. But I 
was in a certain position that I was working as a private investigator. I didn't like the work. It's not for somebody with a brain. And I felt that I still wanted to be a psychiatrist. And I felt that arrogant or not, perhaps it's arrogant of me to think that I could find out where, you know, psychiat people that had studied hadn't worked out why he'd done it. And I thought to myself that I would be the one that would uncover. I, I rather thought, I think when you're abused as a child and you have that trauma, I think you can be um, a victim of not growing up, of being immature and of having a certain amount of magical thinking where you think, oh, this is, you know, I've got a letter here. This has come to me. This is meant to be. I'm going to be the one, you know, I'm going to be so famous. I'm going to write an amazing book and my life won't be a car crash. I mean, mm. at the time I felt it was a car crash. I was pretty clever at school. I was, you know, my friends had gone off to Oxford and Cambridge. One of them is now a professor at Southampton University. And I was, you know, pretty much, pretty much, you know, in, in a bad way. You know, even the boyfriend I was dating, he was pretty rough. You know, I knew that he was like, you know, into crime. And I knew my life wasn't normal. It was out of kilter. You know, I was going and working in these agencies. They were using me for um, rubbish work. And I was dating Ray. And I, 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 you know, I did love him, but he wasn't really... He wasn't really for me. He was, you know, I was dating him, I think maybe, I don't know, he was a tough guy and, you know, I had that protection that I feared. And so I thought, well, life has offered me this. I'm going to go along and I'm going to find out all his secrets off of him. This is my idea. Can you take us into that visit then? Can you just set the table and describe what it was like to go in there and sitting down with him, the atmosphere, what he was like, encountering him. Yeah, well, that very first time, I, I visited him three times and over, spaced out. And the very first time you get searched, I had, I think, white cowboy boots or, no, I didn't have, well, that was the second time. I had like a business suit and a little bit like you're wearing, I thought, well, you know, I'll dress like I'm a professional doctor, whatever. And um, so a business suit went there, gave my name. They said, who are you coming to visit? I thought they'd know. And so I had to say Ian Brady and they give me like the filthiest of looks. And I began to think I was a little bit out of my league actually, because um, I was very young and I thought this is like too much. Um, so I went in and they showed me down to his room. The the nurse they showed me down to his room. Um, I looked in. He was kind of sitting, facing out. He has a window and it's reinforced, obviously. And then they said, oh, let's go straight down to the visiting room. So I kind of backed up. Then they called him out and I followed him down the corridor into this um, room. This is about this size. And I sat... I suppose like we are now really. And I felt a little bit out of my league. I felt overwhelmed. I felt that he mm. was maybe more intellectual than me. And he was looking at me as if, who the hell are you and what do you actually want? And, you know, in that way that when people are paranoid and I started to swear and feel, you know, totally out of my league. And so I thought, I know, I'll just come on like a um, journalist. Um, at that time, I hadn't met any journalists, but, you know, I knew I'd seen them on TV. So I started questioning him, you know, do, do you like it here? You know, do you ever think about your crimes? And it basically went like a journalist would seeing him. And I got up at the end of it. He, I saw him go over to one of his cronies, this kind of guy who looked a bit scary, and say, oh, what do you think of her over there? And then he came back over, sort of looked at me weirdly, walked off down the corridor back into his room. And I was still waiting there for the staff to take me out. And then I was looking down at his room and then he came out 
and sort of saw me and must have thought, oh, she should be gone by now and then walked kind of past me and then back again, which was all quite weird. And then a nurse took me out and said, oh, your letters are really interesting. And I said, oh, how do you mean? And the nurse, it was a male nurse. And he said, well, you write about life and why we're here. And he finds your letters very interesting. And the nurse said, oh, I find your letters really interesting too. And I'm like, oh. And I just felt really overwhelmed. I just saw, mm -hmm. you know, I really feel that I shouldn't be here and I'm not going to write letters like that again because it's, you know, he's a real person in my mind, it was someone in a book and, you know, I, I, I don't really want to play um, at being pretend psychiatrist anymore. I felt very overwhelmed. And I went home and Brady sent me a letter saying, um, it's obvious you're a tabloid journalist and um, you played a very fly trick this afternoon on me. Um, you're a journalist, which paper do you work for? I know he's really, it was a really angry um, letter. And um, this is around the point when he was going back up on the moors to look for the missing graves. He was in the newspapers every single day. And one day I was around my boyfriend's house, Ray, and I was looking through the Sunday People and there was an article about um, Brady has been visited by a mystery blonde. And who is the mystery blonde? He's um, fascinated by her. And I said to Ray, oh, that's really weird, isn't it? This blonde. And he went, it's you, you stupid bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it can't be me. Because, you know, when you're working class, you don't think, newspapers are going to write about you. And I thought that can't possibly be me. And I phoned a another private detective called Alan. And I said, Alan, I, you know, um, have you seen the Sunday people today? I think that's me, but I'm not sure. And he said, well, why don't you go up to Scotland? And he had some friends up there and he said, go up to Scotland and stay up there with my friends. So I remember packing my stuff and getting dressed up, beige jumper, and I had a gold bracelet, and I was all ready to go off on the train. And I got a phone call at um, my mother's house, and it was Alan. And he said, come and meet me. And I said, why? You told me to go to Scotland, and I'm meeting your friends up there. And he said, no, you should come for a drink. And it was in Ealing, uh, a detective agency there where he worked. And so I went along, and as soon as I went, there were these two guys in the pub, and I said, who are they? And, and he said, look, it's best you talk to them. And it was the Sunday people. Mm -hmm. And um, he had set me up with them. So I disappeared. I just ran, got on a bus. They followed me and came back to my house. And they were saying, oh, Alan's told us you thought he was your father. And I said, "That no, that was something like years and years ago. And it, anyway, it was just like a quick a quick thought. And obviously it's a kid in a kid's home. It's not true. How could it possibly be if you think, I mean, it's not going to be. Um, and that was Phil Hall and Ted Hines. And they brought me back to um, the offices, the Sunday people offices. And then they took me to a hotel in Swiss Cottage and gave me some drink, gave me some vodka, said, calm down and said, you know, well, why were you writing to Brady? And I said, well, I, I was just interested. And they said, well, we like this story about you being his daughter. So you can, I know it's pretty bad. Um, so you can have a choice. You can um, either be the new Myra Hindley because you look like her anyway, and I didn't, um, or you can be his daughter. Wh which, which one? Do you want to be a silly tart that writes to him, the new Myra Hindley? Um, or the daughter and I was crying I was really upset um, I rang Alan who had sold me he, I found out later he got paid £5,000 they never offered me a penny for my story he didn't ever give me anything for um, the front page um, they said to me we're going to fly you up to see Brady and I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't really want to go and see him because after I'd got this angry letter, um, I talked it over with Ray and we said, no, I just bin it, you know, it's, 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 there's nothing there. Um, he's, you know, um, pretty serious dude, really, you know, um, pretty um, intense, just, you know, 
Um, so I decided not to correspond anymore. And so the idea of going up to see him again, it really didn't appeal. And especially they said, you've got to go in there, um, show him your birth certificate, which I, I got, you know, a birth certificate in my handbag, um, show him that where it says name of father and say you thought it was him and say, are you my dad? And I'm like, you know, why, why would I do something like that? Um, but I cried and cried and I had the, the choice of being um, a stupid tart who, who writes to him or, or go ahead and do this. So they took me to a studio and they dressed me up, um, lots of red lipstick. They quaffed my hair and put a gold top, took pictures of me. And I didn't, it's not how I normally dress. I was, you know, a bit of a tomboy. And they took me up. Um, we went on a flight actually from London to Liverpool and went in to see Brady again, which, you know, I was sort of forced to go in and see him. Um, I got there and it was late. I got there at five minutes to four and the visiting hours ended at four. Mm. And the guy said, you can't come in. And I said, no, I said, look, it's five more minutes there. And he gave me the filthiest look. And I remember I had white cowboy boots and they searched them and I was tarted up to the nines from this photo shoot. And I went in, saw Brady from a distance clutching a plate because it must have been their feeding time. And he went into the um, the room and I said, you know, um, oh, apologies for turning up like this, apologies, um, you know, it's late as well. And he said, well, you know, what, what do you want? And I said, um, and he sits in a weird way, you know, he was always smoking and he'd like sit to the side and look and say, what, what do you want like that? And you'd be like, um, had to say something. And I said, the press have got hold of me for um, visiting you and I don't really know what to do. I thought, can I come out with what they want me to? No, I just couldn't. I, it would seem bizarre. And he's not someone to sort of, you know, um, ask around with. And I had the cutting um about the mystery blonde. And I said, look, this is in the newspaper. And he snatched it off me and he said, can I keep this? And he sort of held it like that. And I remember thinking, well, well no, I, I want to keep that. And I sort of went, and he just held it. And I said, no, okay, you, you keep that. And they said, um, the, the guy sitting because he had visitors, um, Visitors had to have a guard at that point. It was only the third visit that didn't. And um, he said to me, um, keep away from the press. So I'm like, oh, okay, then fine. Thank you. And you know, they were waiting outside. It's quite amusing. And then I went outside and immediately Phil Hall said, what did he say? What did he say? Did he admit he was your father? And I said, can I tell you when I get back to the hotel? And I was trying to think, what am I going to say to just get them, you know, to do something to maybe forget the whole thing and um they made me walk up and down outside um part lane and take pictures and they weren't getting the right shot so i was so tired because i hadn't slept the night before but they're just making me walk up and down mm. walk up and down to take these shots of me and i've actually got one of those shots now i look so angry um in the shot and then we flew back to um swiss cottage we were in a hotel back there i said I wanted a drink. They gave me um, a lot of vodka. And they said, did you ask him? And I said, yeah, I asked him. And he said, oh, I have no idea um, what that's about. And don't know your mother. And no, never had a child. And they were like, yeah, you're kidding. You didn't ask him, did you? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and they said, okay, well, you're on the TV. Do you want to um, see yourself? And I, I couldn't believe it because I thought, you know, why why would I be on the TV? Because now you know that it's a no, non-story. Um, and, you know, it's, I've become a journalist since then. And if I had been in that position, I, I don't think I would have done what they did. Um, so they turned on the TV and there was a picture of me all glammed up and a, next to a picture of Brady. And it said, um, my life, um, my life with Ian Brady or something. I mean, it was just total rubbish. It was really bad. And I thought, what life with Ian Brady? You know, there wasn't, I'd gone to see him. It was a mistake. And um, that was that really. And I phoned 
Alan and I was crying and crying and really upset. And I said, I don't know what to do. I'm really scared. They're going to say um, I'm his daughter or possibly his daughter. And Alan said, tell them to that you want to take, be taken out of the country because you're too scared. So I turned around to them and I said, I want to be taken out of the country. And they said, OK, we can do that. And so next thing we went on a um, ferry and we drove through France and we ended up in a gorgeous hotel um, in a place called Pont du Gard. And we stayed there and the first story went out and they called it on the front pages. I was really scared to see it. And they, they brought it to my room, which is a beautiful room in the south of France. And um, there was me on the front page of the Sunday People saying, I am Brady's daughter. Yeah, I know. No. And um, are you okay to turn your phone notifications off? Oh, that's not off? me, is it? Yeah. I thought I. And if you're off. watching this, then all of the links for Chris are in the description box below this video. If you want to check out her literary work, and by the end of this podcast, we will also have the social media links for her and any contact links that she gives us as well. So. Please go down and support Chris's work. So you're in France? Yeah, so we're in France and he brought this newspaper in and it, there was me with the red lipstick on and these earrings, pearl earrings and looking like I didn't ever look. And with the headline, I am Brady's daughter. And it was, you know, it, it was horrible. And Phil said, oh, but we had to write it like that. And I said, well, why would you write it like that? Because I, you know, didn't think, you know, it crossed my mind once in a kid's home. And he said, but that way it covers us. Because if we say, oh, you're Brady's daughter and you turn out not to be, then we look bad. But this way it can be, you've said it. So they were covered. I know it's appalling. And again, because I was brought up um, to respect the middle classes and that I'm middle class and anyone... I'm working class and anyone middle class, you know, you do as they say and you respect them. Uh, so I just took it really. And while I was there, I, I fell in love with Phil, um, probably because I was blown away. You know, I'd only known working class men and, you know, fairly rough men. And he was middle class and a writer and good looking. And I was really attracted to him. And we ended up sleeping together in the hotel and it wasn't something CD. He told me he was in love with me and, you know, I had feelings for him and I saw him doing his journalist work and I said that I wanted to be a journalist and he said, well, when we go back to London, I'll, I'll teach you. And so when we were, we were out there for two weeks, I think, and during that time, there was another story went out about me. This time it was a middle page. And I remember one night we were out having dinner in this gorgeous place called Egremont and having oysters and, and wine, brandy. And I, I had seen in a newspaper something about Emma Ridley getting paid £10,000 for her story. And I thought, well, I've been on the front page. Now I'm on the middle page. And I said, don't I get paid, though, because I've done a story. Shouldn't I get paid? And Phil said, greedy people ask for money. Um, just be grateful. You've got your your side of things out. <laughs> I know. It was pretty bad, pretty <sighs> bad. And I came back and I remember sitting on the ferry and... I saw Ted Hines as a as a friend and, you know, because it was like three of us and we would link arms and walk across this bridge and, you know, we had a whale of a time and we would swim and it just seemed to me to be an awesome time with these two intelligent men who were writers, which I wanted to be. And I thought we were good friends. I, I suppose I thought it would never end. And then on the ferry going back, they seemed to change towards me. And it was like I wasn't there. And I felt, started to feel really bad. And um, they said, oh, by the way, your parents have phoned you. We've got to pick up a bin bag with your stuff from um, your house. And I'm like, oh. 
And they said, oh, your uh, boss contacted us. You're not allowed to go near the agency. So I was working for um, an agency worldwide at the time. And I'm like, oh, so there I was. I had absolutely like nothing. And I'd been all over the newspapers. And I said, well, where do I go? Literally, I, 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 they picked up my bin bag with my stuff in. And I said, what, what do I do next? It was like that. But obviously they, well, this is where you go by, you know. And I was like, what? what's the next procedure? What happens next? And Phil put me in a um, B&B &B, um, in a court and he came to see me a lot. We went out to dinner and um, next thing the guy in the B&B &B came in as a foreign guy and he came in, he said, you could earn a lot of money working for me. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you write one of my girls. And I was pretty upset. And I said to Phil when he came that night, I, I think I've been asked to be a hooker. And he said, oh, we'll have to get you out of here. And he looked at me and he said, God, isn't this weird? He said, there you were. You were a private investigator. You had a good life. You had a boyfriend. You had a job. And now you've got none of those things. Your boyfriend doesn't want to speak to you again. You haven't got your job. Your parents have thrown you out. And here you're in this place and somebody's asking you to um, work on the street. He says, so strange the way we've got all that power that we can just ruin people's lives just like that. And... Um, mm. I'm like, yeah, well, I guess it is. And um, he went, he did see me, um, you know, every night. Um, and then I got in contact with an old boyfriend of mine, Barney, and he said he had a house um, that he um, could let me live in. So I moved in there, um, kept seeing Phil. He would take me out um, to Joe Allen's and places. I started learning to be a journalist. I was worried about the story in the newspaper. A few people I'd seen had seen it and said, you know, that was really out of order. Didn't you know what he did and this kind of thing. And I felt quite upset. And I said, um, to Phil, I don't think I can live in this country anymore. I feel really ashamed of, of that story. And um, he said, well, where would you like to live? I said, well, America. And he said, well, have you got any money? And I said, well, about 300 pound. He said, well, I could double that. He said, if you go. And um, so he gave me 300 pound. Um, I had another 300 and I just got on a plane and went to New York and got there, walked up and down um, Times Square and looking around and this guy stopped me in the street and said, you lost. And I said, yeah, I've just come to America to live, but I've got nowhere to go. I haven't got that much money. And he said, if you um, can stay for one night somewhere, I'll come tomorrow and I'll get you a room. And so I stayed in a motel and he came the next day, put my suitcase in the back of his car, drove to Brooklyn and got me a bed sit with, with an Italian woman called Bina. And um, I lived there for a while. Next thing, Phil rang me and said, I'm doing another story on you. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, uh, Ian Brady has written to me. And I'm like, oh. And he said, he remembers your mother and he thinks after all that you are his daughter. I know. So I said, mm. you know that that's not true. Um, it, that's not true. And um, he said, we're still going to run it. And um, we're going to call it Brady admits he's her dad. Dad. I mean, it's not the word you should use for him anyway. And um, Oh, my God. I know. It's pretty horrible. Um, so I then moved to somewhere on Staten Island. I was doing bar jobs to get by, but it was pretty hard and it got cold. And I ended up in a really awful bed sit on Staten Island. There was a lot of old guys there. And I went to the local shops and two guys in a car saw me and they said, are oh, you a Brit? And they had a baseball bat. And it, it was pretty, pretty scary where I was. And I was falling under and I know what I was falling under. And I rang Feel and Phil said, why didn't you journalize? I taught you, didn't I? And I said, well, okay, I'll try and journalize. And I started trying to do it and I got stories for him. I got one on um, some black racists um, who were going to come to England. I got another on Madonna losing her hair and another on Howard Beach trial. So he sent me the odd hundred quid for these stories that were appearing in the Sunday People under his byline. And um, 
Next thing he said, why don't you write to Brady? And I said, well, you know, I'd rather not. That was pretty, you know, too much for me. And he said, well, that's what journalists do. And you've got an in there. Don't give it up. So I sent off a letter to Brady, said, I live in America now, blah, blah, blah. And through came this letter. And therein after, had there was a weird dance between um, Brady giving me stories, like things that he wanted to get in the press, like he believed that he was the father of, I suppose he took the ball and ran with it, with him being a father to everyone. He said that he was David Smith's eldest son's um, father. And of course, I repeated off the letter to Phil and Phil was like, I'm going to run with that. So... That kind of, I know, did he pay me? No, he didn't pay me. I I, I was left at a point um, where I was thrown out of that bed sit and I was standing in Times Square and I rang the Sunday People news desk because that seemed like my kind of home. It was the only constant. And I got Ted Hines and I was crying. I said, Ted, I've just got a cup of tea in my hand. I said, I've got nowhere to go. I said, I'm hungry and I'm cold. And he said, if I pay for your flight home, he said, you can come and stay with me, but only for a week. So I said, please, thank you. So he did. And I went to live with Ted Hines in his flat um, on Kew Gardens. And I would go up to the Sunday People wine bar opposite, hang out with the journalists. Um, I got speaking to another journalist called Mydrum Jones. And then I hopped from Ted Hines to Mydrum Jones and moved in with him and carried on journalizing and learning about journalism, you know, through Mydrum. He taught me a lot. And then I thought to myself, well, these guys aren't that bright. You know, they're quite, they're nasty sometimes, the way they were hurting people. I didn't want to be nasty. But I thought what they're doing is easy. I can do it. I don't have to carry on being a private detective. So I applied to the News of the World um, as a private detective. And I said, Luke, can I work for you? Um, and also the Daily Mail and the Sunday Mirror. And I got took up by all of them and started to um, become a private detective for the press. Um, Phil Hall at that point, oddly, um, had become the overall editor of the News of the World. He was in Andy Coulson's position. So I ended up working underneath him, which was bizarre, really. Um, that was when they started giving me a lot of work. I was ended up earning six figures. Um, I bumped into to Ted Hines at a party and he said, oh, Phil told me you're earning six figures from us. And I said, yeah, I am. And um, that went on for quite a while. And I ended up getting too much work. Uh, they were using me for nearly everything. Um, it was like they hadn't had a private investigator to work for them. And I became very good with, um, so I'd always have a, had a sixth sense. I've always been a bit psychic as a kid. Like most kids that are abused, they ended up sort of not being in the world. They withdraw a bit. So they ended up having like sixth sense. I think that's common. So I had that. And I remember like knowing what to say to people to get them to talk and who to pinpoint. And I'd always been good at that at detective agencies. So the News of the World really used that skill a lot. And Greg used to come around. I ended up moving into a flat next to the News of the World. And Greg would come around, the news editor would come around my flat and say, I've got this story, I've got that story. How do we get into this? How do we get into that? So I ended up like working from about eight in the morning to, to nine at night, just, just working, 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 like really solid. And it got too much for me. There was one day where this went on for about five, six years. And it, it got too much for me one day. I'd been working out the flat um, I was in, had a gym. I was lifting weights and I came upstairs and Greg rang. I picked up the phone and it was about the Yorkshire Ripper's wife and she was remarrying. And he said to me, Chris, find out the name of the guy. Find out the name of the guy. Find out where she is right now. I think she's in a hairdresser's. Get along with the hairdressers. Get an extra. Get your hair done and um, find out the name of the guy. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. And I'd, I'd just been working out, so my heart was beating from, from the workout. And when we went, do it now, do it, I went <laughs> like that. My heart went and I blacked out on the floor. Um, and so I just, there was a, it was a ported building. 
and I came to, rang the porter, Alan, and I said, oh, Alan, I'm, I'm having a heart attack and um, call an ambulance. So he called an ambulance and I got taken in the ambulance to the local hospital. And I rang my mother and said, yeah, I've had a heart attack. And I was laying on a stretcher with all those things on my chest. And the next, I felt really bad, actually. I felt really sick. And the next thing, Greg Miskew, the News of the World News editor, poked his little face through the curtains. And he was the last person I wanted to see. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, what about the Ripper's wife? And there I am laying with these things strapped on. And I said, I've had a heart attack. And he said, you haven't had a heart attack. He said, stop over-exaggerating. You've had a panic attack. I've already spoke to the doctor. I couldn't believe it that he came and interfered. And it turned out it was a panic attack. It was a serious one. Uh, but I, you know, I, I really didn't want to go with him. I think my mother must have told him or the porter. Um, he took me to a pub and I said, I don't want to do this. I never really wanted to um, be a private detective anyway. Um, and I would rather do the in-depth stories, the in-depth writing, and I want to write books. And he said, what could you write about? You know, he said, that is a really hard business and only a few people earn money out of it. Stay doing what you're doing. And I said, oh, I can't do it. I said, oh, I, I don't think I'm very well. And um, he said, no, get home. He said, have a cup of tea and get on with the ripper job. And so I did. I went home, but I was just really worried about um, having a heart attack. So I said to Greg, I know a guy. Um, he works for all the XMI6 guys in London. Um, I'd worked at his office just for a while. I dated him for a while. He was... Um, Eaton schoolboy, very rich, really powerful. And he had a stable of girls that would do stuff. And I said, Greg, why don't I introduce you um, to a man I know, John Boy? He's got a stable of girls. You can give them all the work. Um, and I arrogantly at that time thought that because I had this sixth sense and he rang me for everything, that nobody would ever usurp me, stupidly. Um, and I arranged for them to go out to dinner together. We went to um, a restaurant in Piccadilly and I had been rung by him every day, 8 a.m. would get a phone call through to nine o'clock at night, seven days a week. And from that day when I introduced them, my phone stopped ringing. Oh. And it stopped ringing from every newspaper, Sunday Mirror, not the Daily Mail, the Sunday Mirror. Um, just, I, I was completely finished. And I found out later, um, John brought them. I didn't know that he was doing it. He brought them the phone hacking and the cyber crime. So they had you spying on celebrities? Yeah, they did. How did that work and which celebrities did you spy on? Um, well, quite, um, quite a few. Um, Elton John, Paul McCartney, um, Liz Hurley, Heather Mills. Um, we spied on everybody. What's the procedure to spy on them? Well, mostly they used um, the SAS, and they were using they were using serving guys. They had there was an outfit of private investigators that Neville Thelback used to run, and he put me with them. And they were nice guys. There's a guy called Rab, and they used to go shooting at Bisley. I went along with them, and I soon found out that Greg Miskew didn't like rap and he didn't like his boys he said they were greedy and he said they were leaking stories that they were working on and he he then set up these parties and told rab and his boys oh why don't you bring the serving boys you know bring 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 them all you know because the news of the world has really lavish parties and so most of these SAS guys came along and greg would slip them his um business card and get them to work for him, basically to do surveillance. Um, so what happened at that point, I was contacted by a company who said they were a computer company. I was, I still have my advert in the Yellow Pages, private detective. Um, they rang me, said, oh, we need a surveillance doing, we're a computer company, we're based along Buckingham Gate. And I said, okay, what do you need doing a surveillance? So I brought with me an ex-army guy called Martin, went along told me what they needed doing a surveillance on somebody and they said six agencies had failed with it and 
I thought, okay, Martin and I did the job. We chased this guy around Buckingham Palace with walkie-talkies. He jumped on a bus. I decided to give up because I thought he was surveillance aware. Um, eventually, I managed to track the guy where he was, went back, and I was sitting at this desk, a bit like this one, maybe longer. And I went back on my own. And all of a sudden, all these guys came in and sat, sat around. There was about seven guys and... This guy, Andrew, introduced me. He said, this is anti-terrorist. This is, this is this, this is MI6. This is, and I thought, wow, what are all these guys doing? Um, and he says, I suppose you know who we are. Actually, I didn't know, but Martin had said as we'd left the following week, they're MI6. And I said, no, I don't think, I don't think they are. And he said, of course they are, look where they are. And I said, no, they're just a computer company. Actually, he was right. Um, they were called CIEX Limited, which is, um, Company X, the C means company and X is X, Company X, uh, run by Michael Oatley, who is a famous MI6 officer um, who met with the IRA um, during the Thatcher years. And they sat down and they didn't want to know about the surveillance. They didn't care. They said, how are you with the news of the world? And I'm like, well, yeah, I work for the news of the world. You've checked that out, fine. And I was wondering why they were so... Um, these heavy rollers. And they said to me, how much access do the news of the world have to the boys at Hereford? And I burst out laughing. I said, constant access. You know, they use them all the time, probably more than the government does. And um, he went really red and he said, why is that so amusing? And I said, well, you know, so I suppose it's not that amusing. I did find it amusing. They were absolutely livid. They were really livid. They said, what else are the news of the world up to? Um, so I filled them in on what the news of the world were up to. And um, I don't know if that was linked with Boyle. Boyle certainly worked for CAX at one point. And I don't know if that is why um, the news of the world were bought phone hacking. But Greg took it up. And so did Phil Hall, and they pushed me out. I had been working from the office, and Phil said um, to Greg, I want Christine to go. I don't want her from the office. He said to still give me work, but let her work from home. But as soon as I was out, I didn't get any more work, unless they got stuck on difficult stuff. And so I was feeling pretty pretty bad about that. And I went off then to um, focus on the real IRA because I had become interested um, in that through going over to Belfast. So I went off to Belfast to live out there and came back, spent a year or so out there, came back and said to Greg, I want my work back as a private investigator. He said, oh, we, we don't do that anymore. We're really high tech. And um, we do stuff with phones, pinging phones and and I went home and I thought, well, that's really odd because that's illegal. And I wonder who in the investigations world is doing that. So I thought, I'll ask John. So I rang John and I said, um, are you doing phone stuff for the News of the World? And he said, no, they pushed me out and they ran up a bill with me for a quarter of a million. And then they told me to get lost. And he said, I had to blackmail um, Andy Coulson that if you don't pay my quarter of a million, then I'm going to tell every politician that, um, you know, you've been, what I've done to spy on them. And when I was having dinner with Greg, I noticed he was on the phone to someone called Glyn constantly. So I said to John, who is this person that's doing this phone stuff? Because it's illegal. And he said, who do you think it is? And I said, well, Glyn, I heard the name Glyn. He said, you're kidding me. He said, that was my office boy. It was his office boy that he trained and what the News of the World decided to do, that John was too expensive. So they would poach his office boy and bring him in, give him a contract. And this office boy didn't know anything about security, anything about not hacking the royal family, anything to do with that. And that is why the phone hacking started. But interestingly, when it all, when they all got arrested, um, and I think probably that it was John Boyle that pulled the plug because he was really angry they being pushed out. Um, Nick Davis from The Guardian knew about John and he came to me and he wanted to find out every cough and spit about John. Um, I wouldn't tell him, but he went off and said, look, I found out about cocaine parties, about houses in London, about MPs. And I said, fine, you know, you write it. Um, I'm not going to speak about him. And then when his book came out, Hack Attack, John wasn't mentioned it at all. So you mentioned the IRA then. Was that, did that have a danger? 
researching this stuff and meeting the different groups? Um, yeah, well, I, I was sent out by the News of the World to um, to do something on the UDA. The UDA were having um, inter-scene battles. They were shooting each other, and Greg Miskew sent me out and said, find out what's going on, why are they killing each other? So I went there found out the story, came back. He put it in the paper. He didn't put my name on it. Um, I felt quite ambitious to become a, a defense reporter. So I started going out there and forging contacts. And I made a contact with um, an INLA officer. And the INLA officer um, introduced me to um, someone in the real IRA. And the real IRA, the Omar bomb had just... Um, you know, that had just happened. The real IRA had come to London on a recruitment drive. Um, I had gone along there, met them, came back, decided to go to Cross Glen and, um, you know, meet up with them. I had the idea of writing a book on the real IRA that was going around my head. And I just managed to get closer and closer to the real IRA. And I ended up, when Phil pushed me out, um, I thought, what, what am I doing now? I felt like completely lost. And I thought, I know, I'll go there. So I went to Belfast, started working for the Sunday Times and just um, started to cozy up to one of their commanders and ended up having a relationship with um, the second in command of the real IRA <sighs> just to get stories. Oh my goodness. I know it might sound horrible, but oh. when you when you've been pushed out of somewhere mm. and being part of the news of the world, you're part of a, it's almost like a cult, you know, and you feel kind of that you can't cope with that. Did you not think that getting stories about the IRA may end up with you getting executed by them? Well, when I mentioned in my book, I talked about the relationship I had with the second in command and they rang me, um, called me some names and said, don't ever come back to Ireland. Mm. So I haven't actually been back. But then you get involved with ISIS and recruiting young Muslims to go undercover in mosques. This sounds equally dangerous. Well, what happened because my stories were so good on the, well, they would be good because, you know, if you're around someone's house in Dundalk, um, they trust you. So they built up trust. So I was getting comms given to me from the prison in Port Leash where all the um, Michael McEvitt was there at that time, I think. And so I was getting comms that they like toilet paper. It's really thin and then they undo it. And I was getting stuff about them having a split um, in the real IRA. So the Sunday Times noticed and then Liam Clark took me under his wing. Um, then I started doing stories on the UDA and um, John White. And John White, who's friends with Johnny Adair, um, we did a few stories together. And then he started, um, he murdered John Gregg, and then he had to flee Belfast. And he gave me an exclusive he rang me. I was in a nightclub in Belfast and it was one in the morning. He said, Christine, I'm just speak to you. And so I got an exclusive, which went on the cover of the Sunday Times. And I met up with Alex Marincheck from the News of the World when I came back to London just for a weekend. And he was in the Rivoli bar, uh, no, Rizzoli bar at the Ritz. And before I went along, there was another guy called John Ross and he said, oh, he's with the CIA watch what you say. And I said, well, why would I watch what I say? I haven't got anything to hide. And so there was an old guy there, um, seemed pretty interesting. And Alex kept saying, because Alex was in charge of Belfast at that time for the news of the world, he said, oh, Christine's really good at cozying up to terrorists. And, um, you know, he was laughing about it, whatever. And this guy said to me, do you, you know, wh where do you see yourself? And I said, doing something more than this. It's quite, you know, it's not really making up stories for the news of the world, you know, pushing. I got to the point where I was going to either the UDA and the Real IRA and saying, you know, make up a story this week. I haven't got anything, you know, say something exciting. And, you know, and they were coming around my house um, at two in the morning and things like that. And it got to a point where I started to feel a bit paranoid because I thought, well, hang on, these are different. These are guys on different sides. And um, then one of the UDA um, guys said to me, you do know the real IRA are watching you, don't you? And I said, well, no. And he said, yeah, they sat outside your house because they're wondering, well, who the 
hell Ooh. you are. Um, so I just left. I thought now's the time to leave, really. And as soon as I got back to London, Alex um, Alex said to me, oh, that CIA officer was quite interested in you. So I said, well, you know, that that's great. And then this American lawyer contacted me and said he wanted me to do some work on a divorce case. He had offices in Park Lane. And when I went there, he he wasn't really interested in me doing um, anything on, on his divorce. He wanted to know um, what I thought of uh, Muslims, actually. And, you know, was I racist? Was my political views left or right? And he used some quite aggressive words about black people and just to see how I reacted. And then he said, we want you to recruit young Muslims um, in this country and put them undercover in mosques and run them for us. How do you feel about doing that? And I said, well, I'm not really sure. I, you know, I can do it. I'll think about it. And um, he gave me loads of books on bin Laden and ISIS. It was quite a few and he said, go away and read them. And that was it. I didn't hear anything, anything more from them. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, nothing. But the phone hacking was raging, I think, around that time. And I think that's when I went back to see Brady again. I'm trying to think of a... Is, is this the physic where he lunges at you? Yeah, yeah. You describe what happens there then. Well, I... Gosh, I was writing to Colin Wilson because uh, Ray and I had got back with Ray again and Ray and I went down to see Colin Wilson. We were fascinated by his work on outsiders and um he recognized me colin wilson from the paper so i'd gone round met his wife and you know as a fan came away and stayed in a bnb &B and was just grateful that i'd been in colin wilson's house and the hotel uh manager rang me and said colin wilson's a reception for you and i was like completely starstruck and he said i've seen you in the paper you're Ian Brady's daughter. And I'm like, oh, come on. He said, yeah, I know, I'm just joking. And um, he, I told him my story and he said, look, I'll help you write your life story. You should get it written down. So um, I started to write my life story. I introduced, um, no, I didn't, not at that point. He wanted to write to Brady. Um, he said, why, you know, why did you stop writing to him? So for some reason, I said, well, I'll write to him and say, you know, that, that you're a good chap, whatever. But I haven't um, spoken to Brady in a long, long time. He's very, uh, Brady is really boring. His letters would be full of politics and what he thought of this country, what he thought of the president of the United States. And, you know, it's not really my thing. And I resented that someone who had killed children didn't talk about that, you know, and didn't have shame around that and rather saw themselves as a politico or something. It seemed like um, it was irritating. He's a massive hubris. And I noticed about him that he seemed to have different personalities, that um, the politico one, that he saw himself as that actor in um, House of Cards. I can't remember the guy's name. He was obsessed with the guy. Ian Richardson, I think. He was obsessed that he looked like Ian Richardson and Ian Richardson was based on him, which which was crazy because he's a politician. And then he had a, a personality which was like a bit like a child. And then he had another personality which was completely mad that used to write things like, um, oh, do you ever hear that Sex Pistols song, um, My Way? I knew the Sex Pistols have got a picture of him and they, they have the song, Just to Think I Killed Those Kids, But I Did It My Way. And he said, I love that song. Yeah. And it really makes me laugh. And I have no regrets for what I did. I just did what I wanted and, and I don't have any regrets. And he said that he had offered sacrifices to this um, being that had appeared to him and that these beings were part of a group and that after death, he would be in credit that now, you know, he had done these murders and he would be, he called them happenings, and he had done these happenings and that he was in credit now in the, in the afterlife. Um, just completely mad. And so I said, you know, write to Colin. Colin, you know, um, would maybe do write a book on you. And he wrote back um, 
how dare you, um, Colin Wilson, third rate, whatever, and all this kind of stuff. And then he added on the end, um, you can come to see me if you like. And I thought, well, you know, I, I just thought that I didn't really want to, but I thought, should I as a journalist now? And I spoke to Greg Miskew about it. And he said, yeah, of course. Um, Greg had become a personal friend. And he said, of course, go. Why wouldn't you go? And he said, go and, you know, we'll do a, a, a spread. So I wrote back to Brady and said, yeah, you know, I'll come, but you do know I'm a journalist now. And he, he wrote back and said, yeah, I know you, you're... Um, you're working for the whopping scum um, because I I um, keep tabs on you and, you know, look over your shoulder because I'm watching you all the time. It's quite rubbish. Um, and so I said, well, okay, I'll come visit, but it will be an interview. And um, he then wrote back, and I think knowing that the, Greg Miskew was also going to be reading the letter, um, he said, have you seen the Hannibal Lecter films? It's based on me and um, my visits now are unsupervised. My psychiatrist, Dr. Strickland, has uh, made it that my visits will be um, totally unsupervised. And so you'll be sitting alone with me. Um, I still have the letter. You'll be sitting alone with me. How does that make you feel, question mark? Are you afraid I might bite you? And bite was underlined twice. And I took it to Miss Q uh, and he was like, oh, this is fantastic. Lovely. We'll have that for a spread. Oh, yeah. you're afraid. And a picture of Lecter and a picture of him. And I thought, you know, it's, it's, it's LARPing because obviously he's not, he's a child killer. Well, you know, any murder of anybody is horrific, but he, he, he he's not this, you know, he's like a very crazy individual, completely shattered into different parts. And... um so I went along and it was, as they said, um, I was alone with him. And again, I was late. Um, I, I am a bit of a latecomer. Um, I got on the train, visiting hours ended at four. It got to four o'clock. I was still on the train to Liverpool from London. And I rang his psychiatrist, Peter Strickland, and I said, look, I'm set to do this, in I called it an interview, I'm set to do this interview, and it's four o'clock, this train's been broken down, but I'm sort of nearly there, um, I could probably get to you for like half past five, and he said, um, yeah, oh, Chris, yeah, of course, you can come, and he's like, this really, I think, must be hippy-dippy dude, and it was a sort of sound of like, I caught a sort of amusement in his voice, you know? Um, and I thought, what am I, some kind of experiment that I'm a, a woman and, you know, I'm going to be alone with him. Um, and I was young at the time. I was 20, 29, I think, back then. And so I got there and I got there late and it was dark outside and we sat in the room. There wasn't much lighting in the room. And there was like a kind of, you know, it wasn't bright like I normally sat with him. And he sat there and he had a list and he went through this list about things he needed to tell me that the press needed to know about him. And it went on and on and it was rather boring. And I was sitting there um, very bored. Um, I think I made some notes. He then said, it then got pretty late and I think it got to about eight o'clock and there was nobody coming. And I thought, what am I sat here with this guy talking and talking and nobody's going to come in and break it up. <laughs> and it was it was just the numbingness and the fact I had to pretend to be interested in what he was saying. Because the only interesting thing about Brady is he did the, those atrocities. Yeah. Other than that, he's completely boring. And um, he suddenly got up and said, oh, it's my medication time. I'll be back in a sec. And so he went out, came back, and looked really zonked. He looked like somebody who had downed a bottle of whiskey and he was kind of swaying like this and I thought oh my god you know is he gonna start saying weird things right you know and a nurse came in and said I'll oh, wrap it up and I thought oh praise the lord 
it's the end. And so I stood up and said, oh, it's so late. And he stood up and I kind of felt a bit kind of, and I went, oh, goodbye, you know, like you do to a mental patient. And he kind of grabbed me and, and lunged his tongue at my mouth <sighs> and licked my face. Ugh. I know it was pretty, it was pretty. It was pretty horrible. Next thing, the nurse came back, and I swear she, I swear she saw she, she didn't see, but she saw like, I, and I swear she laughed. And I, I said, "Excuse me, can I go to the bathroom, please?" Like I, I didn't want her to leave me. And she took me out. I went in the bathroom, washed my face, um, came out, and was starting to feel a little bit spaced out. And I thought oh, I want to get out of here. But I came out and there was nobody around apart from this little um, short little guy with a bald head who was walking around making weird noises. And I thought, this is scaring me. And it wasn't Brady I was scared of. It was the guy because he just seemed like at any moment he might sort of really flip out, you know. And there I was. They'd gone again and just left me. And there was no one else around, no staff. And I stood there and waited and I thought, I, I can't handle this. I'm really scared of that guy that he's going to come punch me. Um, so I walked down to Brady's room, knocked on the door, no answer, pushed inside. He was sitting on the bed. I said, I can't get out of here. And um, he was just ramrod straight, looking really disturbed. And um, he picked up a postcard, a picture of a deer, started going on about how he didn't deserve to be in prison, how it's not right, and um, stuff about how he's dead. Look, I'm in a coffin. I'm dead. And I said, I just need to get out. And next thing, a nurse came towards me. And, I, and she, again, she had that... Um, like laughing almost. Oh, are you still here? And I thought, yeah, I am still here of a child killer. It doesn't seem right. And then sometimes I've recounted the story to other journalists in America and they're like, oh, well, we don't leave our serial killers alone with women. And it's like they almost don't believe it. And, you know, I spoke to other people in this country who said, you should sue Park Lane for, for what went on because not just that, not just leaving me in there that, and I was scared of that other inmate, but the fact that Brady lunged at me. Now, had there been someone else there, I think they would have said, look, he's gone for his medication. He's going to be out of it because I think he was, I, without that medication, he wouldn't have done that for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, so I shouldn't have been left there with a patient who'd just gotten a liquid kosh, not, not right at all. And I'm still considering suing them. Um, so I left and felt really bad and felt really bad the next day. And I rang up um, a woman that I'd been seeing over my sexual abuse. She was a hypnotist and trying to access um, memories of my father and I in Dublin, the sexual abuse memories. I had some of them, but I, there was a like bigger ones that I wanted access to. And she was working on me, hypnotizing me to access them and get them out. And um, I went straight to her house um, after I came back from Liverpool, told her about it, what had gone on. And I said, I feel really weird. And she said, well, you're in shock. And I said, but why? You know, it's just like some nutter. And she said, it's because of what he did. And his crimes, it was almost like he poured them inside me. I started having visions of the crimes. I started seeing a boy being axed up, which is the last murder of Edward Evans. It was absolutely horrific. And I thought, I can't go on like this. So I looked, um, came across this book about primal therapy that helps people that have been um, sexually abused. And, you know, I thought, what am I doing with my life? You know, why did I go and leave myself privy to that? You know, it was stupid. And I'm tired of being stupid. I'm tired of just being, a you know, flopping around Fleet Street, not really having an identity. I would have relationships with men that would be sexual at the start, but then I would freeze up and start having memories of incest and think, oh, I can't do this. This is feels like incest. And so I went off to America to do um, this therapy um, in Los Angeles, primal therapy um, in Los Angeles. And then when I was there, um, I'd only had a certain amount of money, 5,000 pounds I went with. They take 5,000 pounds off you as soon as you walk through the door. Um, it was a therapy that John Lennon has done. Mm. And um, Ted Bundy has applied 
applied to do before he died. He wanted to have primal therapy. And it's basically they bust down your defenses and then they let the emotions come up and then they deal with them. And it's pretty, pretty rough. It's rough. Um, so I started to do that. The £5,000 was taken off me. They then said, we need another £10,000 from you. And I said, well, I haven't got that kind of money. And they said, you really need our help because you're completely lost. And um, yeah, I thought it was a cult. It seemed like a cult. And I think I was probably, um, you know, missing the newspapers and, and feeling like because, you know, I didn't, you know, I felt pretty cast out. And um, so I phoned um, a journalist friend of mine and they... Um, she worked for the Sunday Express and she said, look, we can pay that 10 grand straight to the primal therapy clinic, get you um, the help you need to get rid of your um, child sexual abuse, become a normal person. And um, all you have to do is do an interview about, you know, what Brady's like and, you know, hand over the letters or whatever. So it didn't matter because... Um, Greg Miskew had seen them and they were journalistic, blah, blah, blah. So I sent them all over and she said, that's fine, we'll do that. And I said, you know, I haven't got anywhere to live right now. Will you put me in a hotel? So they put me in the St. James, which is Rod Stewart's hotel, um, which is really nice. I met Rod Stewart and um, they were filming Strange Days. Ray, Ray Fiennes also met him filming Strange Days. And... Um, there was a guy sent along to mind me while the story was going through for the Sunday Express. And I was crying all the time. I was out by the pool. I was crying. And he said, why are you crying? Here you are. You're in LA. You're a nice looking girl. And, you know, you're a good journalist. You're doing this weird therapy, but I'm sure you'll go back to London at the end of the day. Why are you crying every day? And I said something, and it was on the Saturday, and I knew that the Sunday Express had already gone to bed. Um, so I thought, well, I can speak freely to him now. And I said, when I was with Brady, he shoved his tongue down my throat. And ever since then, I've been having like these weird um, hallucinations about his crimes. It was like he's poured something inside me. And um, he went, oh, that's terrible. I said, yeah. And he said, would you say um, it was like sexual abuse? And actually, it wasn't really sexual abuse. It was someone on a liquid kosh, um, you know, who would just launch themselves at somebody because I suppose it was something to do. It didn't feel sexual or anything. So I said, well, not really. Maybe he said, well, you seem pretty upset. Um, and I, he said, it's like someone that's been sexually abused. And I'm like, yeah, maybe it was sexual abuse. Anyway, um, the following day, he had made that front page um, that he had sexually abused me. <sighs> you know, so I felt rather guilty towards Brady that here was this patient in a mental hospital that um, I had now accused of sexual abuse, which wasn't true. And it made me feel bad because I was a victim of sexual abuse to say this. Um, Brady fought it. The Sunday Express went to court, went before a judge. Um, the judge said, I am not going to um, say that it is slander towards a man like Brady to say he sexually abused someone. So he threw the case out. Um, his lawyer went running outside and said to the waiting journalist, the Indy and the Times were there, and said, oh, Brady's won. And the Independent went with that. They're still online and said... Um, Case got chucked out, Brady won. But they didn't, you see, because it wasn't proven um, in the Sunday Express. So they had to put an apology to the Sunday mm. Express. And what annoys me is that's not online. So you just get the one story, but not online. So I decided to write my whole life story in the book, Searching for Daddy. And I put what happened in the book. And I wrote to Brady, I said, I've written a book about you. I've written what went on because that really disturbed me. And I'm sorry about that. And it's not sexual abuse. I disagree with what the Sunday Express did, but it made me feel pretty bad. You know what you've done. You shouldn't have done that to me. And But I do agree that you were probably on liquid kosh. He didn't say anything to me in a return. Um the book went out with Hodder and Stoughton. Next thing, Hodder and Stoughton legal department said we got a letter from Brady and he had cut out the independent where it said he'd won and he said, take that book off the shelves and I want compensation. Look, it's been proven in court. And I merely said to Hodder and Stoughton legal, get the next day's copy of the indie where they say sorry. So they got that, cut it out, went back to Brady, 
get lost, matey, <laughs> which he did. And um, the, the only thing I heard of, of him after that was um, in the Sunday Times um, when I was doing, when he was um, trying to kill himself and I did a world service, BBC world service interview about evil. And he, um, he said that he has never met anyone he's hated in his whole life, but for Christine Hart, he'll make the exception that um, he really hates me and I'm the most despicable person ever. So the next killer you interacted with was the Hillside Strangler? Is yeah. How did that come about? Well, I had, um, I had written the book and I got into the truth community a little bit and a woman had approached me after reading my book and said, um, did you know that you're a monarch, um, mind-controlled slave, an asset for the Jesuits? And because she was American, not being mean about Americans, I love Americans, but they somehow think wacky things. And I'm English and we don't think that. And I thought, there's no such thing as that. So I typed back to her and she was a really nice little pretty picture. And I said, oh, I don't really believe in that kind of thing, but thank you. And she said, no, you, you need to look at your life. You know, you came from a um, Jesuit run orphanage and you've spied on the IRA. You've gone near these men that are also monarch um, slaves. And you realize that they're like you and that's why you went to see them. And I thought, well, that's kind of quite interesting because I always did wonder why you know, I'd gone to see them. And she said, think about that you have a part of you that um, is an altar because these monarch butterflies, they have an altar and it's the altar that goes and does the spying and stuff. And I suddenly remember that one time when I was in Dundalk um, with the, I won't say his name, the real IRA commander I was having the relationship with, that he turned around and said to me, because I started getting paranoid and I said, I want to go home. I feel really scared. And he said, why do you feel scared? You've just been lying with me on the riverbank. And I'm like, I just feel paranoid all of a sudden. And he said, do you know what you seem to me? You're two different people. He said, one is really boring, pathetic, and it's the one in front of me. And the other one is really exciting and devil may care. And the woman um, that was talking to me about that made me think of that day and made me think, have I got an altar? And the more I thought about it, and the more I thought of, sometimes when I was sitting with Brady, I would feel like, what the hell am I doing here? And the other times it would be, I'm gonna find out you know, what he did. And when I was with the real IRA, it was always wanting to burrow in, burrow in really close. And it was going to Dundalk, which is an area where it's a no-go area for the British army. But I just, you know, I, I thought that, I didn't go along with it really. I said, you know, it's interesting. And I was in a little Facebook group about it and, you know, kept a little eye. And then one time a girl in the Facebook group said to me, um, do you remember your sexual abuse? And I said, I remember some, but there's times when I was in bed with my father when I was seven in Dublin where I don't remember the actual act, but I remember waking up and feeling like a part of me was like gone and I was almost like as if it had been cut out. And she said, and I said, I want to get to the one certain night where I woke up and felt that way. And she said, well, what's there? And I said, it's um, like a block. And she said, is it a screen? And I said, it's, it is a screen. That's so clever. And she said, what's it got on the screen? And I said, well, it's got Disneyland pictures, Donald Duck. She said, you been a victim of um, Disney mind control. And I remember being taken to Disneyland. So I started then to investigate a little bit more, but it's such a woo kind of world. You know, it's mixed with the occult. You have to study black shamanism and, um, you know, people that have become these mono assets, they do have a side of them that is psychic. I, and I've always had that psychic side. And I started to think, you know, things I'd done, like um, the commander, the real IRA that I dated, next thing he was arrested and put in prison for a long, long time. And then looking back at the news of the world, I noticed that they had crashed as well and they were destroyed and I had a part in that. So I started to feel like I was probably either a destructive person or I was playing some kind of role that I wasn't getting anything out of. And so I did suspect it. And one night I was watching the TV and I saw Bianchi. Uh, Bianchi is a hillside strangler. And um, they were saying that he had an alter personality and this alter was called Steve. And Chris Berry D, 
who um, I contacted about it, Chris Berry D. We got talking. I said I'm a journalist, whatever. We had a, we got on straight away, um, laughing, and he's pretty funny. And I said I think Bianchi's altar is real, and he said no, 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 no. He's just joshing. It was like you know to find an excuse, but I said no. I said you watch, and it's on YouTube. You watch him confessing in the cell where he's being Steve and he goes through pictures of the girls that he killed and he's like, I did that one, Angelo did that one, I did that one, he did that one, I did that one, Angelo. And there's certain, it's like a kind of a, it's different to the to the man in court. It's like the energy and I could feel it because of my sixth sense. And I got in contact with his doctor at the time, um, the prison doctor, Ralph Allison. And I said, will you send me his medical records? And he said, sure. So he sent over the whole file. And I went through the transcripts of Steve speaking in interview. And it was this like, this disembodied boy and it reminded me of Brady had that kind of thing going on as well, that altar. And I was absolutely fascinating. So I wrote to Bianchi and Chris told me not to. He said, you won't get a reply, don't bother. But um, I always find it easy to somehow um, get a response from men like that. I suppose because I'm um, not mature, I'm quite childish and I maybe speak to them in that kind of language. Um, I got a reply straight away and Chris was surprised and I think it was the second letter he said come and see me in Walla Walla and Chris is funny I rang Chris and said he's invited me to see him and he goes oh my god he said how will you sit opposite him he says you won't do it he said first of all as well you've got to sit on a plane for 24 hours then you've got to get off and if that isn't bad enough then you've got to get on a little plane and fly into mountains he said if that isn't enough if you haven't vomited at that point you'll vomit when you go into the airport because it's really painted weird colors i was creased up laughing he said then you've got to sit opposite that son of a bastard and look deep into his eyes he said and he said you just won't do it and i'm like i want to you know i again there was nothing going on in my life and i thought I'll get a book out of this and I'll write about this monarch mind control. I'll write about um, not realizing that nobody believes in monarch mind control. So I spent three years getting close to Bianchi, trying to access Steve, trying to trigger him so Steve would come out and writing it in a book. Total waste of time. Um, in For the Kill got published. It, 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 it bombed. Nobody's interested um, in that. Nobody's interested. What Nobody have you done? Pardon? What, what Bianchi done? Bianchi, uh, oh man, Bianchi had done, again with Brady, I felt that there was a personality that was like a Nazi. It was like an old Nazi, like Mengler. I felt that. And when I eventually ended up sitting opposite Mr. Bianchi invited me on Valentine's Day. I didn't have the money. It was cost a thousand to get out there. I didn't have that money floating around, but I didn't want to waste it either. So I got a commission from Maropi Mills, the Guardian magazine. Um, they were going to call it Valentine's Day with a Hillside Strangler. And um, so went out <laughs> there. I wrote the first part, 3,000 words. They said, we want another 3,000 words after you've met him. And um, so they paid and... I went in to see him. He came out to see me. I was quite scared going in because as I went in, I started talking to a woman um, called Phyllis and she said, oh, they know who you are, dear. You know, you're going to get away with wearing different cover because they're very strict and, and I'd gotten away with a skirt or something. And she said, that's because of who you are. They wheeled out the red carpet for you. And I said, oh, do you know I'm a journalist? And she goes, the whole prison knows. And I'm like, oh, okay. And um, she said, oh, you'll find Ken really nice. He's a real ladies man. And I thought that odd because he had injected bleach into women. He tortured them. He'd done the same as Brady, but on women, he'd gas them. He'd done this, um, like Brady had said he'd done, like a, a, an experimental thing. Oh, I will see how long you can handle this. And then, oh, you've died. And it's almost like the Nazi... Um, Joseph Mengler, the kind of things. And they have that same scent. Um, so there I was sitting there feeling 
unhappy. It was a big prison visitor room. It wasn't alone with him. They're different in America. Um, they have more respect, I think, for people. The, the, they were armed up, the, the guards, the 20 guards in the room um, for Bianchi. Um, I was sitting there. Phyllis, the, the other woman visiting her husband, had told me a story about how one of the guys had come out with a knife the week before. So I was, I, I felt that I wanted to go. I, I started to feel oh, I pushed myself too far. And um, suddenly the doors opened and the, there was my little table was opposite a, a table of three with the prison guards, quite near to them, I suppose. And um, all the prisoners came out wearing beige and one came swaggering up to me, looking like Robert De Niro, looking mm. like Robert De Niro in The King of Comedy with that kind of attitude, like here I am and I'm super famous. And he just stood there like this and I'm like, oh, um, stood up, shook hands, he sat down. Wasn't he like, chained up or anything? Mm -mm. Wow. Mm. Yeah, we were sitting knees touching. Um, I had this idea in mind that, you know, I, I, when I was out in New York, I'd been to spiritualist churches and done the psychic thing where you hold people's things and you read, um, psychically read them. I, I do that now for a living. Um, and I wanted to touch his watch or a pen or glasses to try and read him. Um, so they'd taken my bracelet off to get through the... Um, metal detectors. So the first thing I did was, oh, can you put my bracelet on? So he put the bracelet on. And as I did, I was trying to read his um, aura and I couldn't get anything. And he then had these glasses. He took them off. He went to get Coke from the, all these machines. And I picked up the glasses straight away, was trying to um, psychometrize them. Again, couldn't get a reading. And I thought, How? I'm not picking up anything from him. He sat down. We started talking about not really much. We started talking about Chris Berry D actually. And um, he said, so you're friends with D? And I said, well, no, I don't really know him. We just chatted. And he said, um, I'm going to take him down when I get hold of him. And I'm like, you know, I didn't really care. And I love Chris to bits, but, you know, I didn't really care that he was saying this. And he said, um, you do know what I mean, don't you? And I'm like, kill him, you mean? He said, yeah, I'm going to take him down. And I thought, oh, God, must we have this? I'm supposed to be scared. And, you know, he went on like this and talking a bit like a thug. And eventually he kind of calmed down. And I started to get a little bit paranoid. Um, I noticed that his eyes were changing color. They're blue. They're like a kind of a baby blue. And somebody said this about Ted Bundy, that his eyes go dark brown and then blue. And Bianchi's were going from blue because I was looking deep into them to try and read his energy and find out why he had to torture women. And um, they went from blue to brown. And when they went to brown, I started to get really like, it was a really weird feeling. It was almost like coldness went all the way through me and I felt as if I wanted to pee myself or run or pass out but I couldn't do any of those things I just froze I just completely froze and it was like I suddenly realized that I wasn't top of the food chain and whatever it was was looking at me was non-human but at people that was the feeling. It was horrible. It was like all these razor blades were zzz, coming at me all at once. And um, I thought, I have, to, but I couldn't, I was frozen. And then suddenly he said to me, Chris, are you all right? And I looked at him and his eyes had gone back to blue and it was him. So I kind of snapped out of the complete fear. And, but the rest of the visit didn't go very well. Um, he was denying what he had done. You know, he sits there and he starts talking about the women that died, you know, the women that died. Well, no, it was girls that you murdered, basically. Um, he's in total denial. And he puts on this little, this little whispery little voice that you're supposed to believe that's just rubbish. And I was waiting for this Steve character to come out. I don't know whether it was Steve at the start when he was threatening Chris Berry D or not, but it maybe I suppose that was the time when I did actually meet the killer because it seemed non-human. But I then I had two um, two days with him, eight hours each day, a um, long time. You have sandwiches in there and, you know, it, it was pretty heavy going. And um, came back 
And because I hadn't done what I wanted to do, I still wanted to access Steve, find out what was going on. I was studying this Monarch Mind Control and they said the entities were involved. So I wondered was, um, did Steve have these entities? You know, what were the entities? Was it ET? Was it demons? Was it Jinn? What was going on? So I hadn't finished. And I said to Murray P. Mills, I haven't actually finished my investigation. And she was like looking at it on a quite a shallow way as if, well, you've been to see him now. And she wanted me to write that I was really scared of him. But because he was going to see it and I hadn't finished digging into him, I wanted to keep him on good terms. And I said, oh, I'm not going to say I was scared of him, even though I, I actually was. Um, so there ensued an argument. And she said, oh, we'll put it in reader's experience. And I said, well, I'm not a, I'm not a reader. I, I don't read The Guardian. And she put it in there without my permission. I had to go to the union. <sighs> so now again, I know they say that the, the tabloids are really horrible and the broadsheets are nice, but they're just as ruthless. Mm. And it sits online now and it makes me look like Little Red Riding Hood. Um, this woman, um, you know, went to see a serial killer and I might see you next year. And it makes me look absolutely stupid. It makes them look stupid because it's just a rubbish story. But it sits online. And I said to her... Um, take that down. It's been up long enough, but she still still sits there and, it, you know, it's incorrect and unfair, but this is what you're up against if you try to reveal that serial killers are actually like little puppets and it's something else involved, you know. I don't know what it is. I still, I still haven't, um, I still haven't investigated. I still haven't dug, but there's a lot of people in the truth community that believe in these entities, reptilians, etc. I've met David Icke. We've talked about reptilians. Um, I talked about my experience with Bianchi. Chris D had the same experience. I came home after meeting him and I started to have a really weird reaction at home. I started to feel that there was someone watching me in the house that was invisible. Uh, of course, I've got sharp sixth sense, so I would pick up on that. Um, but then I started to have really, really bad visions of men being tortured. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? And I rang Chris and I thought, well, I'm not going to lead him by saying, oh, do you're getting weird visions after meeting Bianchi because that would be leading. And I really wanted to find out what was going on because it was scaring me. And so I said to him, well, Chris, um, answer me this. Um, did you notice anything spooky when you were dealing with Bianchi? And he said, oh, you mean the inhuman thing that gets inside your head mm. and gives you horrible visions? And I'm like, yeah. And he said, I've I've experienced it. And I said, I've experienced it now. What am I supposed to do? And he said, well, I ran to the church. And so I I drove straight there um, to a church I went to in Hayes, um, said I, I need a meeting with a priest there, the parish priest. And I told him the story and he gave me parts of the Bible to read. I think it was from John. And um, it stopped. I read them, it stopped. So what about MK Ultra? What are your thoughts on that? Uh... I don't know. I, I, you know, after studying, you know, those guys and, and I think there was something gone on with them. I don't think it was them that organically went up and did those things. I think either there's entities involved in that and the entities um, needed to feed on the victims. They say that these ET or gin, demons, ET, whatever they are, they need to feed on fear and suffering. And these, um, these victims, you know, the, the, these guys, certainly Brady and Bianchi, um, torture in that horrific way. And I don't think either of them know why they did it. They certainly posture, especially Brady. Um, Bianchi sits in denial, but he sent me a load of poetry and the poetry was gloating about what he did. His winter shattered mind where no one else can see. And he knows that he knows. Um, but I don't think they know. So I don't think there's any point in going to serial killers and talking to them because you just get the party line because they don't know, you see. And so I think, I mean, I studied the Quran. I've started studying Quran. I'm getting taught by an imam in um, Oman about the jinn. He casts out the jinn. He believes that there's a race of invisible beings of fire. Um, I think... Biblically, we call them demons, and the truth movement call them reptilians and ET, 
But, um, and a lot of the people in the truth movement think that, you know, the lockdown and what's going on now is because these um, ET have got control and they're quoting films like Oblivion with Tom Cruise. Have you seen that? Where It's really good, actually. I watched it and he thinks that there's been a battle for planet Earth, but humanity's won, but he's actually in with the aliens. It's really quite, well, it's creepy. And then there's another Netflix series, um, Colony, where again, aliens have taken over, but you never get to see them because they're just invisible. And I, a lot of the truth from them is some really um, quite intelligent people believe that these um, creatures that came into serial killers to feed are the ones that have got control right now. I mean, it's quite strange to think about it. If that's true, then we're pretty much in trouble. Yeah, we've interviewed David Icke several times and he talked about these... Um shifting of the energy in the face of the killers and the eyes and all that kind of stuff and the um i asked him about it and he gave a very long explanation but if, if anyone's watching this and wants to see that we've got two three and a half hour podcasts on the true crime podcast uh playlist with david ike they're getting a lot of people viewing those right now since he got especially since he got kicked off a lot of the platforms mm. didn't he yeah, we met in, we went to um, the Priory Hotel in Isle of Wight and yeah, he's he's pretty cool. He was very interested in the phone hacking because he thought it was mm. an MI6 jobby and I'm like, well, yeah, it was. So um, we talked about that mostly. Mm. So if people want to find you then, find your work and find you on social media, we're going to put all your links in the description box below this video. Um, what social media are on, Chris? Well, I'm on, I do psychic readings now for people. I do, um, a lot of people have got attachments, these uh, demonic attachments. I do casting out of them. I do checking to see if people have got them um, so they can reach me on my website, christinejoannahart.com or um, Facebook, Christine Hart on Facebook, um, Messenger. Um, yeah, I don't have books out at the moment. I've just written a book which is about all this and it's kind of, I put it in novel form because publishers won't touch it otherwise. So um, that I'm trying to find a literary agent right now or a publisher. So anybody out there who knows of one, um, I've got this um, 200 thousand um page book that I would like to be out there because I think it's important. 200,000 word work. I know, too. Those words. Sorry, 400 pages that I'd really like out there, you know, because it's my life work and I've worked really hard. And I think that I think I've got something to share about what's going on right now, because I do think that that um, that research into serial killers is, is relevant now with with what's going on. I know it does sound creepy, but a lot of the Americans are coming out and saying that, you know, these um, beings, whatever they are, they, they've got control of us and it's a war against humanity. I know it sounds completely crazy, but watch Oblivion, watch Netflix Colony and then see what you think after. Well, people are cracking up all over the world right now with these lockdowns. So you see the change in the energy and the spiritual warfare. But I think I think it's a good idea to start reading, um, you know, um, the, the words of Christ. You know, if you're a Muslim, read the Quran, you know, get close to God. I'm, you know, when I do psychic readings for people, a lot of the time, you know, there's people coming through like relatives and they're giving messages that it's, it's going to be really bad the days ahead and to keep... Um, um, keep close to God um, because we're all going to find ourselves probably, um, you know, the way things are going, getting there pretty quickly. I mean, it's, but I think if you keep God close, keep Christ close or, or Allah close, then you, you, you'll probably be okay. But I think that's where we have to cling right now. So absolutely amazing journey visiting serial killers with some spiritual life lessons at the end. And if you've enjoyed this, Please let us know in the comments what you have thought. Huge thank you to thank Chris you. for coming on. Like I said, her links will be down there in the description box if you want to support her. What's the preferred method of people contacting you? I like Facebook Messenger, but I think you have to send a friend request. And then, um, so I guess through my website, um, yeah, through my website as a contact form. So probably that's best. I'm sure if a few people will contact you. And um, huge thank you to people who've gone down in the description box and clicked on our playlist, donation links, and all our social links and all of our other stuff. And huge thank you to the new subscribers. Subscription logo is in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So take care out there. Cheers from Guildford. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Thanks. Lovely Cheers. to meet well you. Well done. Brilliant.